Rare is the moment when two job titles perfectly intersect. Uh, and Dr. Holdren uh, is not only assistant to the president for science and technology, uh, and as director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, he is also the chair of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, uh, an organizational structure that was launched uh, by executive order in January of this year. Dr. Holdren was so kind to come to CSIS to speak about what that new organizational dynamic meant, prioritization, uh, gaps uh, in, in what the type of uh, U.S. Arctic policies were out there, where we needed to be more active. And uh, so it's only fitting uh, that Dr. Holdren uh, come to us today and uh, after the president's historic visit to Alaska where there were lots of announcements that were made, but also the role of U.S. science policy uh, in the Arctic. Uh, prior to uh, Dr. Holdren's position at the White House, where he also co-chairs the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, Dr. Holdren was director of the Program on Science, Technology, and Public P Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He was also the uh, Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy as professor in the Harvard's Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, his record is so distinguished, and we are absolutely delighted to invite Dr. Holdren Holdren here to give us a little uh, focus on the science agenda and the research agenda in the United States as well as uh, U.S. Arctic policy. With that, please welcome Dr. Holdren. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm going to run through a rather dense uh, presentation uh, in the next 30 minutes. And uh, if any of it goes by too quickly, which some surely will because there are too many words on a lot of these slides, we are going to post the presentation. We'll post it on uh, my website at the White House, the OSTP website, and I suspect that CSIS will also uh, post it. So uh, I'm going to talk about three things as indicated here, sort of the background for the President's visit, some highlights and initiatives from the visit, and uh, a brief remark at the end on the path forward. So the context for the visit has many different ingredients, what we're, uh, why we're so interested in the Arctic, uh, what our policy and strategy overall is, uh, the impacts and opportunities arising from a warming Arctic, what the roles of the various federal agencies are in Alaska and the Arctic, interagency coordination and international coordination. So I'll hit each of those briefly, starting with U.S. national interests in the Arctic. This group uh, doesn't need this slide read to them. I won't read it to you. But uh, obviously, our interests in the Arctic are diverse and uh, multiply important. Uh, national Arctic policy and strategy in the modern era starts with the Arctic Research and Policy Act of 1984, which was focused on the research dimensions of the Arctic. It's what created the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, EARPIC. Uh, in 2009, there was a combination of a national security policy directive and a homeland security policy directive defining U.S. policy in the Arctic region, defined our priorities across uh, virtually all of the interests listed on the previous slide, um, and it was followed in May of 2013 by another report. All of these are available on the White House uh, website, a National Strategy for the Arctic Region, and that, in turn, was followed by an implementation plan uh, clustering the priorities under three major lines of effort, uh, homeland security, national security, uh, stewardship, international cooperation, elucidated subtasks, and assigned, importantly, lead and supporting agencies for each of the subtasks. Uh, there was a, uh, a progress report on implementation that came out in January of this year, and you can look at that. It's quite detailed on the progress that has been made under those priorities, those task assignments, uh, and so on. Uh, impacts and opportunities uh, from warming. Uh, this is a slide I actually showed at a previous uh, meeting in this room. Um, the uh, shrinking sea ice extent and thickness means both opportunity and challenge. Uh, opportunity for expanded maritime navigation, for expanded fishing, expanded access to seabed resources, but that all poses increased requirements on our Coast Guard, on our Department of Defense, uh, on other management and regulatory agencies with those responsibilities, and it also poses a range of environmental threats, threats to ice-dependent creatures and the indigenous communities in Alaska, the Alaskan Arctic, and all across the Arctic that depend on those creatures, and they're also as I think everybody in this room already knows, 
uh, threats to coastal communities and infrastructure, both from uh, the loss of sea ice, sea level rise, and the loss of shoreline protection by the sea ice, which is particularly important. Uh, thawing permafrost, of course, is a problem up there, threatening land transport infrastructure of a wide variety of kinds, as well as, by the way, threatening to add additional greenhouse gases to the atmosphere that are made available for microbial degradation by the thawing of the permafrost. And finally, warming alters plant cover. It uh, increases vulnerability to wildfire and changes other aspects of ecosystem dynamics. So agency roles in Alaska and the Arctic, there are a lot of them, and in fact, the diversity of these roles and their, uh, their dispersal across so many federal cabinet departments and agencies is uh, the, the main reason that the president in January of this year created the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, and I'll say uh, a little more about that uh, in, uh, in a minute. Um, the agency roles continue on this slide. Uh, including a great many uh, roles within the executive office of the president. Uh, the uh, office of the chief of staff and the domestic policy council have oversight over energy and climate policy and initiatives in that space, including the Arctic dimensions of that. So that's Brian Deese, a senior advisor to the president, and Dan Utek, who heads the office of energy and climate change in the domestic policy council. National Security Council, of course, has large interests in the Arctic around the Arctic dimensions of national security. Um, my office, OSTP, and the U.S. Global Change Research Program have oversight in the White House of Arctic Science and Science Policy, uh, Council on Environmental Equality, of course, Conservation Resource Management Policy. CEQ and OSTP jointly uh, chair CEQ the National OSTP Ocean Council, jointly, Council and the National Ocean uh, Council chair is one of the National Ocean Council and the National Ocean the Council is one of the other two main geographic is, focuses uh, has the, the Arctic. The other one of Mexico. is uh, the Gulf. Uh, CEQ and OSTP of Mexico. Uh, join with the National Security Council and OMB to lead the uh, Interagency Council on Climate Change Preparedness and Resilience, uh, which again obviously has uh, an Alaska and Arctic component. And um, in, the, uh, in the last spot, OSTP and NSC coordination of agency activities, that refers to the uh, executive steering committee, which I will turn to in a minute. Uh, as the first uh, set of elements of interagency coordination, there are these two bodies that were created uh, by the original act in 1984, the Arctic Research Committee the Commission, uh, which is chaired by Fran Ulmer, uh, the, uh, the advisory body that oversees that are all appointed by the president. They have staffs in Washington, D.C. and Anchorage, and they are charged with recommending uh, research policy in the Arctic to the president and the Congress, establishing goals, building links. The Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee is an interagency working group that sits now under the National Science and Technology Council, which is based in my office but has participation across all the cabinet departments and agencies that have uh, science and technology responsibilities. It has a committee, a standing committee on environment, natural resources, and sustainability, and IARPIC sits under that. It is chaired by Simon Stevenson, who formerly uh, was head of polar programs at, uh, at NSF and is now assistant director for polar science at OSTP. The Arctic Executive Steering Committee, as Heather already mentioned in her introduction, was created by executive order in January. And the idea was, in light of these incredibly dispersed responsibilities across departments and agencies, to try to help shape and reconcile priorities across all those departments and agencies to promote coordinated implementation and evaluation. Very importantly, to try to improve the coherence of engagement with the state of Alaska and with tribal groups up there. You know, their complaint is most often not that there's no engagement, but in some sense there's too much and it's too repetitive different departments and agencies coming through and asking the same questions of the same people uh, <clears throat> rather than having a one-stop shop, as it were, uh, that gets the job done. Uh, and finally, uh, the role of the steering committee is to support the U.S. chairmanship of the Eight Nation Arctic Council, which I'll say more about in a minute as well. Uh, we are the chairs of that from uh, May of this year uh, until May of 2017. Uh, I chair the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. The vice chair is Deputy Homeland Security Advisor Amy Pope. The members are sort of what you'd expect. All the departments and agencies, as well as the Arctic Research Committee and IARPIC, are represented there. 
Uh, the steering committee has formed a variety of working groups. They're listed here. Uh, pretty much the obvious ones, overlaps and gaps in agency roles, oil spill preparedness, coastal erosion and flooding, and so on uh, through the list, and ending with support for the Glacier Conference, which just concluded uh, on August 31st, and I'll say more about that. But the steering committee played a big role in pulling all the departments and agencies together to feed in appropriately to the preparations for the President's visit to Alaska uh, and the Arctic and the Glacier Conference uh, in particular. On the international side, the Arctic Council, uh, established in 1996 and aimed at promoting cooperation and coordination among the eight nations that have territory in the Arctic, but also involving Arctic indigenous communities, uh, has been focused on sustainable development, environmental protection, research, and shipping, among other topics. Uh, the principals in the Arctic Council are the U.S. Secretary of State and his or her counterparts from the other seven member states. A number of other nations participate as observers, as do a number of civil society groups and other organizations. Uh, it has standing working groups on the topics listed here, again, pretty much uh, what you would imagine. And as noted, the chairmanship rotates among the eight member nations, uh, two-year terms. Canada preceded us, and we are in the chair now with Secretary Kerry having the lead and being closely advised by Admiral Papp and by Fran Elmer, who in addition to her role as chair of the Arctic Research Commission, is a senior advisor to Admiral Papp and Secretary Kerry on the Arctic Council. So, um, now turning to the visit itself, I'll say a few words about what uh, the administration was trying to achieve, uh, the objectives of the visit, talk about uh, President Obama's meetings and announcements in Anchorage, Seward, uh, Dillingham, Bristol Bay, and Kotzebue, and then what some of the other administration officials who were up there did uh, around uh, those meetings. So the objectives um, listed here, highlight the consequences of climate change in Alaska and the Arctic, including the impacts outside the Arctic of climate change in the Arctic, a, a particularly important issue and one that helps remind people down here in the lower 48 that what happens in Alaska is relevant to them in more ways than one. Uh, second, to demonstrate the administration's attention to a balanced agenda for Alaska. It's not just about climate change, not just about environment. It's about resource development, ec economic opportunity and jobs. It's about reliable and affordable energy for all Alaskans, which is a big problem up there because you have to ship the energy uh, over such long distances and by such exotic means. Uh, environmental protection and conservation, preserving indigenous people's cultures and livelihoods, and of course, climate change, mitigation, preparedness, and resilience. Another aim very clearly was to strengthen links, to strengthen collaborations between the federal government and Alaska's leaders, uh, including not just uh, officials, but business leaders, tribal leaders, uh, and other stakeholders. And finally, an, an aim of this visit was to educate the rest of America about Alaska's importance. I often hear from Alaskans, including uh, Alaska's congressional delegation, that too few people down here in the lower 48 know what Alaska is all about, why it matters, why we should care about it. Uh, after all, there aren't that many people up there, even if it is an enormous area. But in fact, we have already seen uh, that we have major interests up there that really affect uh, all of us, and we wanted to use the visibility that goes along with a presidential visit to, uh, to do some education. So what did he do? In Anchorage, um, start out on Monday, August 31st, uh, with a round table with Alaska Native leaders. A uh, number of topics there, voting rights, salmon stocks, energy costs. Uh, he gave an incredibly good speech. Not incredibly good, because he's President Obama and his speeches uh, tend to meet a very high standard, but it was, I thought, a remarkable speech at the Glacier Conference, uh, which was chaired by Secretary Kerry, attended by 21 nations, uh, by Alaskan leaders, by administration officials. Uh, his focus in that talk, in that particular talk, was on climate change and initiatives to deal with it. Uh, initiatives that uh, were announced by the President, or the President jointly with Secretary Jewell of the Department of Interior, included officially restoring the native Alaskan name Denali to the tallest mountain in North America, uh, an initiative on Department of Interior funding for intertribal fish commissions, an interior-led youth engagement program to promote the Arctic way of life, and a fish and wildlife service-led program on engaging native communities in conservation. 
And there is the president speaking uh, at, uh, at the Glacier Conference. Seward, uh, after the conference, he went to Seward, uh, took a hike to the Exit Glacier and focused there, understandably, on glacial retreat uh, as one of the many indicators of how climate change is affecting uh, the environment in the far north. Uh, took a Coast Guard cutter ride in Resurrection Bay, focusing uh, there, again, understandably, on maritime opportunities and challenges and marine wildlife. Initiatives that the President announced in Seward included, very importantly, accelerating the construction of at least one new icebreaker and working with Congress for more. Every meeting about uh, the United States and the Arctic ends up focusing on why we don't have more icebreakers, why we need more. Uh, in fact, in my confirmation hearing in 2009, I was asked if I would fix the icebreaker problem. Uh, I said, well, I would love to do so, but it's a little beyond my individual capacity to get it done. Uh, I think we're finally going to get it done. Uh, a NOAA U.S. Coast Guard-led uh, initiative to improve charting in Arctic waters for purposes of marine navigation. Uh, a five-year project on Arctic marine biodiversity, a public-private civil society partnership. And uh, the addition to the Arctic Council's March 16th Arctic Observing Summit of a major focus on community-based ecological monitoring, which is a really interesting and promising idea. So here's some pictures of President Obama in the vicinity of Seward, uh, visiting the Exit and Bear Glaciers uh, out on his, uh, on his cruise. Uh, and um, the, the, the pictures uh, from this trip are spectacular. I can only show a few of them, but you can find most of them on the uh, White House website. Uh, Bristol Bay, Dillingham uh, and Bristol Bay, he met with fishermen. Uh, uh, including many native uh, Alaskan fishermen focusing on the protection of the salmon runs in Bristol Bay, the most important salmon runs in the world, very important commercially and for subsistence fishing. Uh, met with residents, uh, participated in a cultural performance at the Dillingham Middle School. That's the picture on the right on the bottom. Um, you see the president with a salmon. Apparently one of the male salmon spurted uh, milt all over the president's shoes, to which he responded, he must like me. Um, <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor, I can tell you. Uh, in Kotzebue, uh, remarks at the Kotzebue High School. This uh, second entry is a mistake. It was actually the Dillingham Middle School. What he did as a second activity in Kotzebue was visited a shoreline erosion project uh, in Kotzebue. So we'll fix that slide before it gets uh, posted. Uh, initiatives he announced there were many, many more than I could fit on one slide, but they included uh, basically uh, instructing the Denali Commission to become the coordinator and empowering the Denali Commission to become the coordinator of federal, state, and tribal responses to coastal erosion, flooding, permafrost thaw, and a range of other resilience issues. Uh, $16 million in new U.S. Department of Agriculture grants uh, to improve rural Alaska water systems. Uh, and also rural development agreements with native organizations. Uh, DOE-led clean energy and efficiency projects on Indian lands, USDA grants to offset high per household uh, energy costs. Um, Senator Murkowski told me in conversation as we were sitting together at the Glacier Conference that more people are being driven out of the villages in the remote areas of Alaska by high energy costs than are being driven out by coastal erosion uh, and the loss of the sea ice, an interesting, uh, interesting factoid. Um, na na the National Geospatial Agency, the NSF, and the U.S. Geological Survey will be leading public-private partnerships to produce higher resolution maps and elevation models for Alaska and for all of the Arctic, very important uh, for many different purposes, including resource management, disaster management, uh, climate change resilience, and more. Uh, a couple of pictures of President Obama in, uh, in Kotzebue. Well, one picture of him in Kotzebue and the other, uh, a picture I think uh, was taken out of Air Force One of Kivalina Island, uh, one of the uh, Arctic towns that is in peril of having to be evacuated completely because of the problems with coastal erosion, sea level rise, the disappearance of the ice. Uh, calendar of other uh, federal officials. A lot else was done up there around the president's visit to amplify it and provide additional opportunities for building links with uh, Alaskan leadership. Secretary Kerry 
uh, hosted an evening reception the night before the Glacier Conference for all of the attendees together with Alaskan officials, tribal leaders, and NGOs. Uh, and of course, he chaired the all-day Glacier Conference uh, the next day. Uh, Admiral Papp went uh, almost a week ahead of the conference, did a bunch of stuff, uh, launched the new Department of uh, Homeland Security's Arctic Domain Awareness Center at the University of Alaska Anchorage, uh, gave a speech at the U.S. Alaska Command, uh, did a roundtable with the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program students and faculty, which I also did later, a fantastic uh, STEM education operation that brings talented kids out of remote communities and provides them, uh, starting in middle school, with access to high caliber math and science teaching, tracks them and supports them through high school, through college, and through getting jobs. Absolutely amazing program. Uh, I was uh, uh, really inspired by meeting with, uh, with these young people who were just as smart as you could possibly imagine and uh, on track uh, to do wonderful things. The success rate in that program, that, which is called ANSEP for short, Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, is just stunning. Something over 80% of the people they identify in middle school end up going successfully through the program and ending up with jobs in the, in the tech sector. Um, Secretary Jewell uh, had, uh, in addition to her role in the Glacier Conference itself, which was a major address there, she gave an address to the Alaska Federation of Natives, took part in a reception by them, uh, and participated with the president in the tribal leaders roundtable uh, in the afternoon uh, just before the president's speech to the whole uh, conference. Uh, NOAA Administrator and Department of Commerce Undersecretary Kathy Sullivan had a busy time up there. She went to the Begich Boggs Visitor Center at the Portage Glacier, which like most of them up there is receding dramatically. Uh, she had meetings at the Alaska Interagency Wildfire Coordinating Center did a tour with Senator Dan Sullivan of the Weather Water Ice Center and also did a tour of the Shell Operations Center up there. Uh, Managing Director uh, Christy Goldfuss of the Council on Environmental Quality, the head of the Council on Environmental Quality, also visited the Portage Glacier. She visited a burn site. You know, more than five million acres have been burned in wildfires in Alaska this year. Absolutely astonishing, uh, astonishing number. Uh, she did a uh, panel at the Glacier Conference on resilience and took part on September 1st in roundtables on rural energy solutions and community resilience. Uh, I took a team up there. Uh, besides myself, we had the head of OSTP's Environment and Energy Division, Tammy Dickinson, who is an expert on uh, natural hazards, landslides, volcanoes, mudslides, earthquakes. Uh, her expertise is much valued in Alaska, I have to say. They are prone to all of those things. Um, the new executive director of the Arctic Executive Steering Committer, Committee, uh, Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, he was until very recently the U.S. Ambassador to Sweden, was very much involved in uh, Arctic issues in his role as ambassador, is uh, off to a flying start, doing a great job uh, helping us uh, run this very ambitious uh, Arctic Executive Steering Committee. And the Executive Director of the National Ocean Council came with us as well, Beth Kurtula, who is a former minority leader of the Alaska Legislature uh, and a native of Alaska. And one of the wonderful things about going around Alaska with Beth Kurtula is you couldn't walk two meters on any street, whether it was in Juneau or Fairbanks or Anchorage, without somebody stopping Beth to embrace her, uh, because she knows everybody in Alaska, it would appear. Uh, we did a bunch of stuff. Um, on August 29th, uh, we went to Fairbanks uh, for meetings at the Cold Climate Housing Research Center, an amazing operation, which is actually building dwellings in the remote areas of Alaska that cut the season's heating costs by a factor of five or six. If you imagine that many people are being driven out of their villages by high heating costs, and you could cut, and it's the largest single cash expense they have, is that paying for their heating. If you can cut that by a factor of five or six, that's just enormously important. In dwellings that are attractive, that fit into the environment, that meet the indigenous people's desires, a fabulous operation there. Uh, we spent much of the day at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a fabulous first-class research university up there, the center of the University of Alaska University system, uh, talking uh, to climate researchers uh, there. Um, including Larry Hinsman, who you heard from uh, this morning. Um, 
August 30th, uh, we met in Anchorage with the Arctic Fulbright Fellows, the first time Fulbright Fellows have had a regional focus. Uh, we met with the uh, students and faculty of the ANSEP program, I already talked about that. Uh, and we met with uh, a group of Alaska mayors hosted by the mayor of Anchorage at his home. Uh, on August 31st, uh, I gave an address to the Glacier Conference on how climate is changing in the, in the Arctic, what it is doing in the Arctic, what it is doing elsewhere, and what we can and should be doing about it, all crammed into 13 minutes. Um, you can tell how I did that by the speed with which I'm going through this here. Um, September 1st, uh, I co-chaired with the Alaska governor a roundtable on uh, rural energy solutions with some of the top energy leaders from uh, Alaska, corporate, government, tribal. Um, and um, on uh, the afternoon of the 1st and uh, the morning of the 2nd, I was in Juneau meeting with local leaders and visiting the uh, Marine Research Institute uh, in Juneau, uh, as well as briefly the University of Alaska Southeast, which is located there. So it really was uh, a rich visit. Uh, th these are some of the pictures uh, uh, from uh, the visit. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention was the uh, Marine Exchange of Alaska in Juneau, which is the, uh, at the upper left, which is an amazing operation run by former Coast Guard folks, which keep tra keeps track of all of the shipping in U.S. Arctic waters and helps people, uh, helps the, the captains of these vessels avoid getting into trouble uh, by telling them when they're heading for shoals, when they're out of the approved shipping lanes, uh, when uh, they're heading for terrible weather and, uh, and what have you. Uh, the uh, upper right is the group at the Alaska Cold Climate Research Center. Uh, at the lower left is uh, a visit we made in Fairbanks to the permafrost tunnel, uh, which was something that was done about 50 years ago, tunneling about 200 meters uh, into a hillside and into permafrost. It is the most amazing experience. If any of you who haven't already been there ever get to Fairbanks, uh, try to arrange a visit to the permafrost tunnel. You walk in about five meters, and there's the thigh bone of a mammoth sticking out of the permafrost. You walk in another few meters, and there's a horn of an Arctic musk ox. You walk in a little further, there's a tuft of grass that's 20,000 years old and still green because the chlorophyll has been uh, frozen into it. You walk a little further, and there's a whole frozen stream bed with an alder root that has been dated at 43,000 years old. Um, you really get a sense of how the permafrost has preserved history up there and a sense of what is being lost as the permafrost, uh, as the permafrost thaws. Um, lower right is uh, a round table uh, with researchers and uh, students. I think that's uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, anyway, the path forward. Uh, we are going to move out aggressively in the Arctic Executive Steering Committee to ensure coordinated implementation of all of the initiatives that were announced uh, on the Alaska trip. Uh, OMB, OSDP, and the Steering Committee are going to be working with agencies to ensure that the agency's FY17 budget requests reflect funding for those initiatives where it's needed. Uh, the Steering Committee will be coordinating closely with both the Arctic Research Commission and the ARPIC on follow-up to research components of the new initiatives. And there'll be a particularly heavy focus there on sharing of data. There's a huge amount of data about the Arctic being collected by a variety of agencies across uh, all of the Arctic nations. Uh, we can do a much better job of sharing and thereby improving the exploitation of those data. And we're gonna be focusing on that, uh, including uh, through the Arctic Council, and that's the fourth bullet. We'll be working with Secretary Kerry, Admiral Pap, Fran Ulmer, on advancing the international collaborative aspects uh, of these initiatives under the Arctic Council. So that's it. I thank you very much for your attention. And again, if uh, you want to go back and focus on any of the gory details, this presentation will be posted. Thanks again. Yes. 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 Good. Yes. Dr. Holdren, thank you so much. That, I, I am going to reread that. There was so much uh, content in your PowerPoint presentation. 
Thank you again. Uh, we look forward to that path forward and working and, and engaging on that. Um, if I could please invite our next panel up, we're going to make a rapid transition to our final panel. And again, th please join me in thanking Dr. Holdred again for a great presentation. Because we're running over time, I'm going to do the fastest switch ever, uh, and I'm going to begin introducing the panelists as they come forward. How do you like this for speed panel? Um, but uh, I think that the great thing about Dr. Holdren's overview, it gives us a whole lot to talk about, a uh, lot of content in there. Um, let me begin by uh, welcoming Dr. Kelly Faulkner, who's the director of the Division of Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation. Uh, Kelly is always so generous in coming to CSIS, and I know she, you have two poles to look after, not just the Arctic, but the Antarctic as well. Uh, but and we thank you, as always, for your, your generosity for being here. Uh, Kelly, um, as director of the Office of Polar Programs, oversees the funding and logistics of the U.S. investigators who, who conduct Arctic research, uh, and she's uh, also had 20-plus uh, years of teaching at Oregon State University uh, and uh, has just been a real stalwart in the program. Um, after Dr. Faulkner speaks, we're going to turn to Dr. John Farrell, Executive Director of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. We certainly saw both NSF and the U.S. Arctic Commission up on those slides with lots of taskings. Uh, John, uh, the, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission advises the White House and Congress on Arctic-related matters and uh, implementation of the National Arctic Research Plan. Before coming to the Research Commission, John was the Associate Dean of Research and Administration at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island, and has uh, had some great experiences on the Healy that maybe if we have a few minutes, he can tell us about his time on the Healy. And last but not least, Senator Murkowski gave a great shout out to Dr. Kathy Cahill, Deputy Director of the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration. Uh, this uh, specific center was created, established at the University of Alaska Alaska Fairbanks, uh, and the center uh, uses unmanned aircraft systems to support uh, missions within government and science communities. So we're very much looking forward to that. And her spare time would not uh, focusing on the center. Uh, Dr. K. Hill is a professor uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, what I thought we would do is just have everyone give a, a few minutes presentation. And really, this is sort of the panel that synthesizes what we've just heard from the first panel and uh, Dr. Uh, Holdren's speech. And I want to keep a promise to Senator Murkowski. I am going to ask you about uh, the International Science and Research Agreement that the Arctic Council is working on, maybe your reflections on that, because she asked us to keep our eyes on that. So without further ado, Dr. Kelly Faulkner. Thank you, Heather. So uh, we've heard a tremendous amount in the last uh, few hours. It's hard to summarize it all really quickly. So what I'd like to say is that I'm really gratified we've gotten to this point where when we were a small group talking to ourselves, um, we hope to get to. So I think we're getting there and we need to continue to work to get there in terms of getting messages out about the need, and in my case, uh, stumping for basic research because I work at the National Science Foundation. If you're not familiar with us, we are a small independent agency that was funded to promote the progress of science and to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and to secure the national defense. And we do that by giving out um, grant awards through a competitive merit-based process uh, throughout the country. And uh, so, for example, our work that we sponsor in the Arctic is actually conducted in all 50 states. Um, so that's, I wanted to make clear because I think uh, we were talking a lot about Alaska. We certainly do have a wonderful group of people in Alaska. You heard about some of that today. Um, in fact, the Arctic unit that I oversee has about a third of its projects devoted to Alaska. Um, but we think it's extremely important that we also keep an eye on the bigger system. Just look at a map of the Arctic. If you don't understand what's going on in the Russian Arctic, you are not going to understand the system. So we view it to be very important to keep uh, a very broad view of the system as a whole. National Science Foundation conducts basic research on, on pretty much every discipline you can think of. 
For the Arctic programs that we have, we cover everything from microbiology to geospace weather and everything in between, including social and economic impacts on people in the Arctic. So um, in, in doing so, we are always looking for the best ideas. And the best ideas could come from Florida. <laughs> they could come from uh, throughout the country. And with respect to international cooperation, um, I just want to uh, draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, we, we feel it's very important to maintain connections with international partners in order to be able to optimally use assets. We heard about don't expect more resources. Do be clever about what you're doing with your resources. And we're all endeavoring to do that. We're trying ever harder to coordinate in an interagency sense. And I think John will tell us a little bit more about the IARPIC. Um, but we're also trying to leverage our international partners' assets. I can tell you about one great example um, that Ambassador Brzezinski was uh, part of, of starting to initiate and that we have an arrangement that we're piloting right now for use of the ODIN, the icebreaker ODIN. Um, and so we held a workshop to see, you know, are, were there really important science questions that we could use the ODIN for in the Arctic if we teamed together? Um, Sweden didn't have the money to put her up in the Arctic on a regular basis. We didn't want the full brunt of it. So what we, we would just pose this workshop to answer those questions. This workshop report was done uh, in sponsorship by Bigelow Laboratories in Maine, so <laughs> Senator Angus should be happy about that. But uh, that workshop has uh, reports been posted. And um, we had a cruise, our trial cruise this year, that was up between um, Greenland and uh, Canada in, a, in Nares Strait, a place called Peterman Glacier. And it was absolutely spectacular success. The platform uh, performed wonderfully for all of the science that they were looking at there. So we look forward to seeing a, a large number of papers uh, coming out of that work. And we're looking to another cruise uh, in around the 2018 time frame where we'll, we'll be looking at things having to do in the high Arctic with predictability of our, our uh, forecasting systems and, and other things. So that's just one example, um, and again, we, we look forward to fostering those teams. Um, I think uh, maybe it got into the news, or perhaps not, but the Healy went to the top of the world recently. Um, again, that was a, a program that the National Science Foundation sponsored. It was a program called GeoTraces, and it was trying to get just very baseline information on trace elements and micronutrients and, and some of the uh, potential pollutants um, that just we just didn't have for the Arctic. So that is also proving to be very successful, but um, changing ice conditions uh, allowed Healy to get to the pole this year. All right, so um, I think I want to just say one last thing, and that would be um, that um, the Scientific Cooperation Task Force that was mentioned. Um, the Arctic Council has what they call ad hoc working groups, and they stood us up under the um, Karuna Declara Declaration. And we worked for a couple of years on what is the best way for us to enhance cooperation. And we came up with uh, two basic notions. One, that um, there are barriers right now to getting things done, barriers of exchange of people, data, equipment, um, and samples across borders, um, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, we worked on, also on the notion that, um, that we need to promote uh, joint initiatives, but not excluding other nations, not excluding the observer nations. So we drafted a, um, and I have the pleasure, by the way, of serving as the head of the U.S. delegation for that. It's co-chaired by um, the United States and Russia, and John Farrell is one of the, the uh, delegation as well as our others. So um, we've got, we had a draft agreement and we came to the conclusion based largely on discussions with our Russian colleagues that if it wasn't legally binding, it might not be worth the paper it was written on. And so we went through our internal process within the U.S., the State Department leads, C-175 process, <laughs> where you basically have to create what you think a final agreement would look like and have every agency and government debate it uh, and decide whether it should go forward. 
It's not an easy process, but we decided to go forward, as did seven uh, of the eight nations, and our only holdout at this point is Canada. This is a consensus-based effort, so you do have to have everybody on board, and we suspect they'll be on board shortly. They're facing um, elections. They have their attention turned to that at the moment, but in, after that's over with in October, uh, we fully expect that the agreement we've been working on and honing um, will be able to be completed within our chairmanship. So with that, I think I'll... Kelly, that's super. Thanks. Great, great information. John. Thank you very much, Heather. And first of all, I'm here because Fran Omer couldn't be here, so she sends her regrets. Uh, and she also wanted to thank CSIS and the Arctic, uh, Arctic Caucus very much for focusing specifically on what the Arctic Research Commission cares very greatly about, which is Arctic research. So thank you very much uh, for organizing this session and giving us the opportunity to participate. Uh, at fir first, I thought I might reflect on some of what we heard earlier today. I think that's what Matthew encouraged us to do. And then I'll speak a little bit more on some of the broader topics, uh, including what the commission is. Uh, uh, the, the glacier event and the associated visit by the president is almost like a boa constrictor trying to swallow uh, you know, a deer to get around all of the things that happened during those few days. A tremendous amount just to see the president dancing in, uh, in Kotzebue, to see you know, all of these things. It was a tremendous, uh, a tremendous amount of activity and information. So there's a lot to respond to or consider in response to that. Uh, but I'd like to speak on a couple specifics. Uh, one was the president's description of an accelerated acquisition of new Coast Guard icebreakers. I was really curious, what does that actually mean? Um, so I, I think the bottom line is we're going to have to wait to see what the FY17 budget says. It's going to be a deliberative process. Uh, but some of the key questions are, you know, what's the role of the administration in this acceleration versus what's the role of Congress in this administration? Both certainly have critical roles to play. We s frequently hear that, gee, a billion dollars is a lot of money for an icebreaker, yet we can read in the Washington Post that we're thinking of committing between 55 billion and maybe as much as 80 billion for the next generation B-2 bombers. So someone is sitting there with big piles of money making decisions. Is this a priority or is it not? I think that's really a critical question. It's a lot less expensive than uh, the next generation B-2 bombers. Uh, but I'm in no position to really know how that uh, calculus is made. Another issue on the icebreakers is will this be a purchase versus a, a long-term lease? That has certainly been bantered about in discussion, interesting topic. i uh, be curious to see where that goes. Another question on the icebreakers is what's gonna be the constellation of requirements for that vessel? Uh, it's gonna range from security for emergency response research. What's for this new heavy icebreaker that's being discussed. Where will those various missions come in and when will that be shared with the public and have further discussion on it? Uh, I certainly hope the new icebreaker will comply with the IMO Polar Code since Coast Guard will be enforcing it. I, maybe we'll take that as a given, but we hope so. So let's stay tuned on those FY17 budget deliberations. Uh, second topic was charting of the Arctic marine environment. Critically important, uh, again, a Coast Guard related mission. Uh, interestingly enough, tomorrow in Silver Spring, NOAA's Hydrographic Service Review Panel will discuss a report from the Emerging Arctic Priorities Working Group, led by Lawson Brigham, who's an advisor to the Commission, and they're focusing on the criteria that NOAA should consider in prioritizing its missions for hydrography and charting in the Arctic versus the rest of the nation. I mean, there's a huge demand, a huge area, uh, and charting issues come up. Look at this summer where Fenica on its way north, hit an uncharted, shallow uh, um, problem. Um, so, you know, certain, dis uh, I think we've seen in some NOAA reports saying that even if NOAA at current funding levels worked on its highest priority areas in Alaska, it would take about 100 years to do the very highest at current funding levels. So I think this uh, hydro hydrographic service review panel uh, we'll be discussing things like funding for such charting. Is it time for a line item in, in the NOS, National Ocean Services, budget for such a thing, given the importance of how charting aligns with the national strategy for the Arctic region? Uh, is it possible for the National Ocean Service to integrate data from other sources? 
uh, both commercial and in the, say, the academic fleet. I mean, Healy just went to the North Pole. Did it do a complete sweat of bathymetric charting as it went up and back? Will that be incorporated into such uh, charts? It seems like that's a great opportunity. Shell has an agreement to provide some of these data through NOAA. So that's another interesting opportunity to use data from other sources if it can be integrated into the NOS. I mean, NOAA also needs to know better what's the demand pull for these charts from, from uh, seasonal traffic level, from tug and barge operations. Uh, that's really important. Where do we go get these charts uh, first? Um, so another thing on the infrastructure that we heard so much about was uh, ports. Uh, we, do, we do know, for example, that the Port of Nome, uh, there's been a feasibility study to look at uh, significantly increasing uh, the capabilities of that port. Also, there's a price tag of about $210 million to do it. Where's the money for that going to come from? Private partnerships, who knows? From the science angle, as we mentioned in our Arctic research goals and objectives report, which there are copies of downstairs. Uh, the science issues on that are, do we have frequent enough updating on the engineering guidance documents that address sea level rise, for example, or the degree and frequency of storm surges uh, and wave set downs? Because we're more frequently now than in the past hearing, oh, it's another 100-year storm. Geez, like every three years we have a 100-year storm now. Uh, so some of the engineering guidance is a little out of date on the engineering atlases used to do this infrastructure. So we have to make sure that the research is done to inform those engineering documents so that the infrastructure that we do build has some resilience and some longevity to it. Uh, we heard about Denali Commission. Uh, they're going to get a small bump in funds to build resilience. That's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, on the rural Alaska water systems, we heard about USDA grants for water and sanitation. That's a real big topic, and that's one thing the Commission has also been working on. For example, we recently published an Alaska water and sanitation retrospective, which was an analysis of all the systems that have been done historically in Alaska, what's worked, what has not worked, so that as we move forward with these systems and these big expenditures in infrastructure, we do it as intelligently as possible by learning from our past uh, wins and losses, if you will. Um, it was also interesting to hear Dr. Holdren talk about resource development in one of his slides, and in energy in particular, and I think it'll be very interesting to hear from the Department of Energy in response to the National Petroleum Council's big study on the Arctic and the energy potential there. Perhaps the Secretary's been busy with uh, you know, all these other negotiations, but that was a comprehensive big study. A lot of feds participated in development of that study done by the council, and uh, we certainly look forward to hearing what Secretary Moniz has to say about that, which was delivered in March, I think. So that's sort of my crossover of what I heard this morning. If I could, one more thing. Senator King asked 10 key questions, and shame on me, because I think we have a lot of answers to those 10 questions. You know, I think a lot of the things he said are outstanding questions. There already are great answers to. And so shame on us for not doing the proper job of briefing him. So I've made a note to pick a rip from uh, Orno and from Bigelow and to make a visit and talk to key staff. Because <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff. It's just not been uh, communicated yet on those things. So I think he'll be pleased with what we have to uh, give him on that. Okay, Arctic Research Commission, uh, shameless plug. Again, I talked about this, but we put a lot of work into it. There's a lot of pictures. It's not a heavy read like a lot of documents around this town. <laughs> it's really succinct. Uh, and uh, there's six goals. The commission focuses very broadly on research, so our goals are climate change, Arctic human health, um, natural resources, the built environment, which means infrastructure, uh, Arctic cultures and community resilience, and international scientific cooperation. You know, punchy little thing, please have a read, please send us your comments on that. Uh, we also do, in addition to water and sanitation, we do other ad hoc reports that we've got all over our website, so please have a look. Uh, we also do things like trying to increase public awareness, which Dr. Holdren talked about. We do little things like uh, brochures on 
why the Arctic matters and talked about what Martin talked about. When, this is a picture of the Potomac, by the way. It looks like it's uh, you know, nice sea ice pictures with pancake ice, but it's actually the Potomac. <laughs> uh, how many people in this room heard about today's event by reading the Daily Arctic Update? Okay, good, thanks. That's another way we try to reach out. Um, and so on. Uh, IARPIC, I would mention one or two things about that. That's the interagency effort to take the recommendations the commission makes and other input and to work closely among the other agencies to do a better job on gaps and overlaps on Arctic research and make sure that we're re working, as Dr. Holdren suggested, in a more effective way. And I think there's, that's been a big success story, to be honest. I mean, the White House released a five-year Arctic research program plan. Uh, that plan has almost come to its end. It ends in FY17. Interestingly, for the feds in the room, that document is specifically referred to in the budget guidance memo that OSDP and OMB send out. Basically, they tell people like us, as you develop your budget, make sure you address the issues in that plan, which is a big thing. It's hard to get that in a budget guidance memo. Uh, IARPIC is currently refreshing their five-year plan, and they're working further to reduce overlaps and gaps. Uh, two other big issues I think are important. I want to follow up on, on Kelly's talk about uh, scientific cooperation. She's doing a great job leading the task force. It's very good to see, and I want to talk about Russia in this regard. Russia is doing an excellent job on this, co-chairing this. They are participating fully in a very engaged manner, and they're very keen on seeing a good, strong document produced. So we're very encouraged by this. Uh, and for us in the U.S. or any of our Ar Arctic neighbors or non-Arctic neighbors that are doing Arctic research, scientific cooperation with Russia is a critical component. You cannot have half the territory in there and have no observations from it, no science from it, and say anything about the Pan-Arctic if you don't also involve Russia. And that's not to say that Russia itself is making a lot of, and has historically been a powerhouse in terms of Arctic research. Uh, it's uh, their, their own contributions as well as cooperation have been critical to the success of understanding uh, Arctic research. We've got two people in the audience, Jackie Grebmeyer and Kathy Crane from NOAA, who can speak uh, with great experience and knowledge about efforts to cooperate on marine scientific research expeditions. And Kathy running the Rosalka program at NOAA, which has been tremendously successful at cooperating and making key observations for many years, uh, and how difficult it is to maintain that. It's never easy doing these international cooperations. Sometimes we have breakdown communications within our own government. Sometimes it's on a bilateral basis. Sometimes it's just within Russia. I see Vadim here too. I communicate regularly with Vadim to say, tell me what's going on in Russia. I'm not quite getting it. I'm back to the old Winston Churchill conundrum. <laughs> And you know that one, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but perhaps there's a key, and the key is Russian national interest. So thank you, Vadim. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Jackie, for your efforts to keep this international cooperation going. Uh, it's critically important. And I think one of the next steps where this will be even more important is on marine ecosystem research and fisheries research in the high central Arctic in light of recent agreements on fisheries. So now that we've got an agreement in place, or uh, a declaration, I should say, it's really important to follow up on the scientific research in that area, because without it, we'll never have a sustainable fishery if one is to ever exist. So it'd be great to see some progress on that, particularly in NOAA. Um, there's lots of wild cards, human health, thawing permafrost. You know, there's large viruses tied up in the permafrost that are coming out. It sounds like a horror movie coming up, but interesting stuff. I really like the focus on uh, the boreal forest. I mean, it ties together so many things to really emphasize how the Arctic is a system. You've got this, this summer, we heard all about wildfires in Alaska and in other places. Okay, that's because things are drying up and warming. Well, that leads to when you burn the area, suddenly when the vegetation comes back, it's no longer spruce to the same extent. It's now birch or aspen. Well, that's less favorable to caribou who want the lichen, so that's more favorable to moose. You've got mosquitoes into the mix. I mean, it's amazing how these things are all connected, plus the precipitation. So it's so important, as we heard from a lot of the scientific crew, 
you've got to break down these systems. There's elements to it. You also have to then build it up in an integrated system. Um, and I'll leave it at that. John, number one, not only are you executive director, you are also head of sales and marketing at, of the Arctic Research Commission, and we approve, and I love your analogy of the boa constrictor. And I'll take you know, Kelly's uh, comment, you know, aren't we so glad that we have all of this activity? But it is a lot to consume. It is a lot to follow up on. And John, you made some important points about some outstanding work. Dr. Cahill, take us home. Okay, speaking for the researchers in the room, um, Everything that they've said in terms of what is there, what is needed, is very, very important. They're highlighting key issues. We've done a lot of the gap analysis, and that's how Kelly gets a whole bunch of our proposals, <laughs> is we figure out where there is a need. And the answer is, in the Arctic, there is a tremendous need, and we need to develop the technologies and the capabilities to answer the questions that the politicians are asking. And a lot of these cases, you take a look at the conditions you're dealing in, and we, we've got the four Ds. They're dull, dirty, dangerous, or denied. And if you can hit any of those categories, you want to look at ability to use technologies that are not going to put people at risk for doing a lot of these measurements. I mean, the example of earlier, there was a chart of the road system of Alaska, I think, that George gave. You saw the large sections here you can't get to. And so we need to develop the technology to answer the scientific questions that people are asking. If you only know what the precipitation is along the road corridor, you've missed a large portion of the state and what the climatic impacts may be. If you think about Alaska stretching from California to South Carolina and up to Minnesota, you might have an idea of the region we're trying to grasp. So with us, what we're trying to do is figure out how can we get that data that is needed to answer these questions over this huge geographical area where we can't access it. You know, if I want measurements in Arches National Park, I can drive there. If I want measurements in Ruby, I have to fly there. So it becomes a very big logistical challenge. And part of why I was brought in to, as the researcher, is to talk about the fact we have technologies that are emerging that are gonna help answer some of these questions. And a lot of them, you know, we're working on things like on ice buoys, we're looking at underwater remote vehicles. We're looking at things that can get us the measurements and do it in a way that is cost effective, logistically is reasonable. You want to deploy an ice camp, you're talking about a serious amount of money and a lot of commitment. So we want to really maximize, as, as previous speakers have said, any measurement we do, can we get the most value of it, out of it? So if we send the Sekuliak, which is the NSF Arctic research vessel, and I have to put in the plug, UAF run, um, out into the Bering Sea, what measurements are we making? Well, if we're just doing conductivity, temperature, and depth, we're missing a tremendous opportunity. We can put unmanned aircraft on it. We can now measure ice ridges. We can do distance. We can do underwater vehicles, look at ice, uh, depth, we can do a whole bunch of different things where we're taking those measurements simultaneously and dividing the costs among more people. It makes it a bigger cost effective thing. So I'm going to use for a second in terms of uh, the unmanned aircraft as a way to talk about some of these, but really we're looking at technologies along these lines. We want to be able to work in conditions that are Arctic. Arctic right there causes a whole bunch of challenges. If you want to do marine mammal surveys, you are now sending biologists and pilots 3,000 miles off the coast of Alaska. What happens when there's an accident? You lose your biologists, you lose your pilots. This happens on a regular basis. How can we institute technology that will help get the marine mammal counts we need to see what's happening along that ice edge? What is happening to the animals? You know, are the walrus able to haul out? Are the ring seal populations decreasing? We need to get that best quality data available but we don't want to put people at risk doing it. So we're doing tests where we run unmanned aircraft to see can we do animal counts? Can we do this safely and reliably? And for us, a really good example was with ring seals. Ring seals follow the ice edge. We want to know what the populations are like because the ice edge is changing. So we can send unmanned aircraft or we can send piloted vehicles. You want to make sure you're doing something that's comparable. We don't want to break a data record. Data is very hard to get. You don't want to change something midstream and screw something up. 
So we talked with the biologists. We took their normal camera, adapted the exact same model for an unmanned aircraft, and did flights. And what we found was, first off, the animals like unmanned aircraft a whole lot better than they like helicopters. Um, if you've got helicopters and you've got a ribbon seal, you either see the tail splash as the animal is going in, or you see the animal looking up at the helicopter. It does make them a little easier to spot in some of the photos, but um, it's not really the count you want. So unmanned aircraft, we could do the same flight, exact same quality of data, but the animals didn't notice the unmanned aircraft. And so they're chilling. You don't see the tail splashes. What have we just done? We have taken away some of the risk for humans. We've also improved our data quality. So that's the type of thing we want to do. And there are a tremendous number of opportunities here. Um, you want to have marginal ice zone flights. We've worked with DOE and NOAA to do flights off elliptic point to look at the sea ice changing and how climate is changing over the Arctic. Um, mapping and surveying, oil spills, all of these things are places where we can do measurements. We, unlike most uh, tourist drones, actually do work with the Alaska Fire Service um, and do not interfere with fire operations, but we can map perimeters that they can't get using satellite data. So we coordinate, we say, okay, when are you guys down? We'll work with your, the FAA control to sterilize the airspace and we can go give them a better perimeter. We can tell them where spot fires are. We have better areas. We can look at fire behavior. So scientists can go back later and say, okay, this area is sterilized. It was a really, really hot burn. What was the dynamic? So that's very, very useful. We can also use these internationally for cooperation. We're doing unmanned aircraft work in Iceland. We're doing it off of Canadian Coast Guard cutters. Um, we've got a, a Arctic Circle conference coming up in October. The Russians want to come talk to us about their unmanned aircraft efforts. So it is an area of international collaboration because we all need the data. So we can work together on this. And of course, Senator Murkowski said, you know, this is important for our communities. We want people in the Arctic to have high-tech opportunities to be able to stay where they are. And this is another example. So she called out what we call the modern blanket toss where we get junior high school and high school kids with their hands on little unmanned aircraft. Well, when you turn a little kid loose with an unmanned aircraft, it's like turning a big kid loose with an unmanned aircraft and or any scientist loose with an unmanned aircraft. What do you want to do? You want to go fly it. So they've actually arranged a program where the kids learn the safety, they learn how to build them, they learn how to do the payloads, and then they go fly them. And they f are flying them on things that are important to their communities. So we have coastal erosion being measured by high school students in coastal villages. This is incredible. The students are doing the data, they're doing repeat flights, they're doing differencing, um, they're doing it with FAA knowledge. Um, so we are not flying illegally, unlike most people. Um, so it is a case where you know, you've worked through the process and these kids are excited about technology. And it also gives them, if they're doing surveying, skills they can use in their communities that are valuable. So it's the, there's an education component to all of this. There's community engagement. This, this is just a good example of what any technology or any scientific researcher can do. So for us, community engagement, a good example, um, we had um, our, one of our earlier speakers talk about using the pickaxe to get through all of those ice trails. We fly unmanned aircraft, give them 3D models in their hands you know, in terms of on paper, what's going to be your easiest path? Where do you have to do the least amount of pickaxing in order to get to the lead? That is a real important thing to the community. community. It saves people effort. It's a wonderful way of value added to the communities from the researchers. It's not just us taking from them. It's also give us giving back to them. So with the new technologies that are coming on board with this focus on Arctic research and the need for high quality data, you can, if you do it right, bring all of these things together and really move things forward. And so hopefully we can help meet a lot of the president's objectives in terms of the, the initiatives that have been outlined. We can hopefully get Dr. Faulkner a bunch of really good proposals. And of course, we'll happily accept the money. Um, and you know, we've got the Arctic Research Commission really kind of leading the way on a lot of the issues we're dealing with. So as you know, a researcher dealing with the technology, there's a lot we should be doing to help fill the gaps and be able to answer Senator King's questions about 
what is happening and hopefully if we're doing it right, be able to present it in such a way that lay people can understand it. Dr. Kegel, thank you so much. I think, uh, th thank you, absolutely. <laughs> Three, three great uh, presentations. Thank you so much. I know our time is very short. I just would like to take a, a one or two questions and then just have our panelists sum up. We sort of stand between you and lunch, so I want to be very precise. But do we have any questions for our panelists? Well, let me ask uh, one before you all go. And this was, um, and maybe there's some in the audience. So the, the White House was conducting a gap analysis, uh, part of the executive order. Has, in fact, that gap analysis been concluded? Uh, and how, if you can share with us, uh, what gaps in the science agenda have been identified by the steering committee, and how are they being uh, uh, focused, or how, what's the, the plan forward? Kelly? So that uh, gap analysis was written more broadly, not just the science-based. Um, but I and I think what we found in that, though, had some elements of science that we felt might need more attention. I think um, John could echo me here that we wanted to be sure that uh, the health of populations in the Arctic had sufficient attention and. I lost a very good employee from my agency to go work at, at uh, mm -hmm. At uh, the National Institute of Health to work expressly on this issue. So <laughs> I think we have some good things that are coming out of having recognized that. Um, and then, as John mentioned, we have um, these mechanisms in place that we are exercising, and we do need to refresh the uh, five year plan for the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. We need a lot of community input on that. I think there are a couple of things uh, that have come up. I, I want to mention one thing. We've spent all, most of this day, in science terms, talking about climate-driven changes. But again, since we're basic research, we have to remind ourselves there are other really important drivers, the wild cards that John referred to. So for example, Alaska is our most seismically active state. It had our most deadly earthquake in 1964. Um, and there are about 40,000 earthquakes a year in Alaska. So the state itself has a, you know, a, a watch out for it and, and a certain number of seismic stations to keep track of, of places. But we didn't have, until now, a good understanding of the whole fabric of the state. Where are the, the activities happening? What is the tectonic structure of the state? Where are the faults? Where do we need to worry about in terms of placing new infrastructure? Okay. so. I'm very proud to say that NSF has had a transportable array uh, that we've been marching across the country, and it's now located in Alaska. It's in the process of being completely installed, but it, it is to cover the entire state and into parts of Canada that are of the same tectonic regime. So in a few years, we're going to be able to use basic research to help in some of these, these areas. Um, so I think um, I'll turn the the comments over to my colleagues here. Um, I think in terms of gaps, John may have some additional ideas beyond the high Arctic fisheries he mentioned. Um, but I, I've covered a lot, but so I, if there's another question, perhaps. Uh, 30, or, or, th or 30 second, how does the private sector work in this? Private sector companies are also uh, very large science programs. That's sometimes how we can leverage government funding. Is there uh, any thoughts on the future of public-private sector cooperation in the field of science research? Um, one, one other thing, I guess uh, I'll grab the mic right back, because we, we had been mentioned on the slide that John um, Holdren showed that the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NSF, USGS, had partnered on a public-private partnership to do high-resolution digital elevation mapping for Alaska and then the entire Arctic. Um, so that's exciting. That's a very exciting project. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the president announced it while he was uh, up there. Um, to see what we can do from the sky um, compared to what we've been doing and by other means um, or what we have in hand. And the exciting thing about the White House involvement in that is we've been able to connect with a couple of different companies, Google and so forth. And so what is going to happen when this elevation map is produced is we're going to have unprecedented ways of distributing it. Um, there are going to probably be apps that community members in Alaska could use that are pretty much focused on 
making it useful to them. So um, that, that is one thing where um, <clears throat> the White House connections to some of the in, um, IT world um, is, is going to be very helpful to all of us. And, I was gonna say, and I'll weigh in on some of this as well. Um, with unmanned aircraft being a very, very hot topic right now, the FAA did just allow permission for commercial flights. So anything that is repetitive is basically a commercial flight. So right there, the university is out. We can't do those. We cannot compete with commercial, we're not allowed to com compete with commercial interests. But it is opening a whole new baseline for people who want to do infrastructure studies in the Arctic and looking at changes. People who want to do repetitive mon monitoring of various things. This can now be done in a commercial manner. And so we're getting a lot of partnerships where we're developing new commercial unmanned aircraft industry and it's being coupled with the researchers. And so you're getting some very nice public-private partnerships there where they can take routine data that we can't, that we can use for longer-term science studies. Fantastic. I am so sorry, time is so short, and I'm gonna, maybe our panel can stay around for a few moments to ask or answer any questions. Let me begin by thanking all of our speakers. Outstanding presentations, very rich content. We thank you, and Dr. Jeffries, thank you for moderating our first panel. It's clear to me that uh, good science brings good data, which brings good policy, and uh, this uh, crosses all the boundaries of Arctic policy making, and, and this was a, a, a terrific discussion my thanks to the Senate Arctic Caucus, uh, to Matt Borger and colleagues, uh, as well as to Senator King and Senator Murkowski, as well as Dr. Holdren. I think we have a lot more to tackle, whether it's icebreakers, whether it's some of the other challenges, that Senator King's wonderful top 10 list of Arctic issues to cover. But I thank you for joining us, for staying with us today, and we look forward for future conversations uh, focusing on Arctic transformation. With uh, your gratitude and your applause, please thank our panel for a great discussion.